All right. This is Wizard of Oz. This is a copy from about 1920, but this story had been out by, I think, for almost 30 years by, by that time. And it's a great children's story, but there is a theory out there that um, L. Frank Baum did not write this just as a children's story. And I'm going to give you a competing theory, and it's really laid out, and you should read all of this. It's The Wizard of Oz as a Monetary Allegory, um, allegory by Hugh Rockoff from Rutgers University. We'll put this up on, uh, I don't know, put it up on the Blaze or Glenbeck.com or something. This is a great, it really explains it all in depth, and I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights here. But everybody knows the story of Wizard of Oz, right? But you don't know about the big crash that happened in the 1890s. And if you compare the story and the monetary politics of the era, it's known as the populist era, it'll all suddenly jump out, of, uh, out at you. The movie changed a few things that are not in the, um, that are not in the book. It was, um, right here you see it, Dorothy stood up and found she was in her stockings for the silver shoes had fallen off her flight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. They're not ruby slippers, they're silver. And the yellow brick road is not yellow in the book, it is gold. Gold bricks. In 19, or sorry, in 1893, what you have to know is that farmers and miners helped form a free silver movement. And they were applying pressure to Congress they were all pro-silver because they wanted to drive up inflationary rates. Why? For the same reason that our Fed is doing it now, to pay off their debts. They wanted to pay their land off cheaply and get cheaper loans. And instead of working within the system, they tried to get Congress to go in and intervene. At first, they rejected them. But then Congress was bought off and Congress helped. Congress caved and provided a solution to the problem. And they mandated that the U.S. buy millions of ounces of silver. So people went out and they redeemed their silver notes for gold. But it wasn't long before the minimum limit of gold reserves was reached. And you couldn't redeem your gold notes for gold anymore. Remember, this is the time when gold coins were there. People didn't want the currency because they knew everything was being changed. So panic ensued. Well, no one knew it at the time. But The Wizard of Oz, which was uh, written in 1900, was written based, according to some, on this silver crash and also subsequent economic crisis. And I want to show you a little bit. Dorothy is the little farm girl. Dorothy's the little farm girl, and she represents um, the U.S. She represents all of us. And she's knocked out during a tornado, and the storm wakes up, um, uh, gets her and pulls her and her house into the wonderful world of Oz. The tornado, uh, which is um, here, the tornado actually represents the um, free silver movement that swept across America at the time. So this is the tornado, the free silver movement. When she comes to in the land of Oz, she realizes that her house has crushed the Wicked Witch of the East, which is uh, bottom, bottom, right here? No, that's the Wicked Witch of the West. The Wicked Witch of the East, I, um, I don't know where she is. But she actually represents um, the house coming down on her foot. Um, that is the, um, uh, the bankers in the East. The populist twister if you will, was aimed at the witch. The witch represents the Eastern financial industrial interest, their gold standard and their political allies, the big banks back east. That's what that does. And the ally was really Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was a guy who was not for this at all. He wasn't for the silver standard, and so they needed to make him into a bad guy. The enslaved munchkins... The enslaved munchkins had no idea what was really going on. Um, the death of the witch, they, was, they celebrated it, but they knew about the silver shoes here. Ruby slippers, they're in the book, silver. They knew that this was good, the yellow brick road was good, and the ruby slippers were good, but they didn't know why. 
That represents the enslavement of the average person that just didn't understand what was going on. That's rep representative of how the elites back then knew how silver worked, but the farmers didn't. Dorothy says, how can I possibly get home from this? They tell her to seek out the Wizard of Oz in the Emerald City. Well, here's the uh, Yellow Brick Road. Remember, the Yellow Brick Road is gold. The Emerald City is Washington, D.C. Her journey there represents the populist effort at the time to get enough people to come along with them and acquire power in Washington. Dorothy and her friends face all kinds of hazards along the way. They're turned away by the wizard, who has no sympathy for their plight. The wizard is the, uh, is the politicians of the time. He's just, um, he's just a political guy. And the political guys wouldn't help them unless they got something in return. That's why the wizard says, kill the wicked witch of the West and bring me her broom. Just like politicians. And then just like a politician, we later learn that his power is achieved through lies and deception. The scarecrow, the tin man, and the lion. Who are they? Well, the brainless scarecrow is the Midwestern farmer whose years of being ridiculed as simpletons because they just, they just didn't understand their own economic plight had them believing in it. The scarecrow falls on hard yellow bricks, a reference that gold was hurting the farmers. But he also demonstrates common sense and resilience in the end. He has a brain after all. The farmer figures it out. The tin man is the nation's industrial worker who's been just reduced into nothing but a machine. Remember, he used to have talent, and then it just, they became cogs in the wheel, and biz, big business did it to him. He's rusted and worn out. He's unemployed, like many workers of the period. And the last is the lion, Courage. Who is this guy? Well, this is William Jennings Bryan. He is a politician at the time. He's a congressman and then later Democratic presidential candidate from uh, 1896 to 1900. Uh, Bryan was um, known for his roaring rhetoric. And he was per, um, portrayed in the press as a lion. He was a free silver advocate. Supporters said he was courageous, but critics said he was a coward when it came down to it. His supporters also slammed him when he failed to fight for free silver in the election of 1900. He realized, okay, I got to back off of that because that's not getting me any place. Dorothy, in the movie, travels down the yellow brick road. In the novel, it's called the Road of Yellow Brick. On the way to the Emerald City, she's doing so in her silver slippers. That is gold remaining supreme and the free silver movement. And here is the bimetallic standard. The Wicked Witch wants to get the slippers back, but her powers are incomplete because she has to have the silver shoes proving in the book the theory is that gold requires the existence of silver as a standard right along with it and we all know what happens to the witch in the end right dorothy splashes water on her and she begins to melt now you're going to have to read the end of the essay on what that means but you have to understand as i see it uh the wicked witch is the big banks and Bernanke. And you'll understand that the wizard tells you everything you need to know about financial crashes. Well, Ben Bernanke is our wicked witch of the West. And if there's anybody that deserves to have a bucket of water thrown on him, it would be our Ben Bernanke look-alike, who looks just, I think it looks just like Ben Bernanke, but here's what happens. Um, he doesn't go away, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we have to work a little harder than a bucket of cold water. Back in a minute.